Hello again, everybody. I'm Brad with Northern Brewer. And another question that we do often get quite a bit is about the whole process and topic of kettle souring. So we are going to put together a little video here um, to demonstrate the process and a lot of tips in order to, to help you out along the way. And to do this, we are going to be using our Duck Duck Goza kit, which by movie magic, I already have in front of me. So, Let's get to it. Kettle souring is basically using lactobacillus to make your wort sour before it's boiled. And what this helps to do is it keeps the lactobacillus out of the rest of your brew house so you don't have to worry about contaminating batches down the line. And before we really get into depth on all the, the different steps involved, uh, we'll just give you a short overview of the process. It's as easy as creating your wort how you normally would, whether you're using malt extract or by all grain methods. Uh, collect the wort into your boil kettle, bring it to a boil, and that just makes sure it's sanitary. Chill it back down, add some lactobacillus, wait for it to sour, then you're gonna boil it again, add some hops, whatever other ingredients might be in your boil, and then you proceed as normal with a standard fermentation and packaging methods. And before we go in depth on our whole brew day here, let's talk a little bit about lactobacillus. So what is it? Uh, well, lactobacillus is a strain of bacteria that actually produces lactic acid, and that's what we perceive as sour on our palate. And it is, it's been used for centuries and centuries to uh, make sour beers. And this is just one method you can use to make a real quick turn sour beer without having to invest a lot of time and uh, a lot of space in your fermentation area. Much like standard brewing yeast, whether it's an ale or a lager, you will find that lactobacillus does come in a few different flavors. Um, they do have certain benefits. Some will sour at lower temperatures. Some will create a more intense sour. In the case of this beer, in this video, we are using the Omega Yeast Labs lactobacillus blend. It is a blend of two, I believe, different lactobacillus strains that produce a rapid sourness and they work wonderful at kettle souring temperatures. If you're as excited as us to get back in the brew cave and see more full length brewing videos, let us know down below what you'd like to see, whether it's a technique, a recipe, any sort of basic beer style, and be sure to subscribe so you know when those videos drop. All right, let's hit the brew house and see how it's done. Just as with any brew day, you're gonna start by creating your wort, whether it's by malt extract or all grain methods. This particular recipe, the Duck Duck Goza, is really heavy on wheat, both malted and unmalted. It does have a handful of Pilsner malt and Munich malt in it as well. Uh, because of the very high proportion of wheat, we definitely recommend using some rice hulls that will keep your mash from sticking up. Uh, otherwise, just proceed along with your malt extract recipe as you normally would. One technique I often employ when making lower gravity beers is to actually use a bit of a thinner mash. And uh, what this does is help so you don't accidentally end up over sparging your mash. And by doing over sparging, you can accidentally leach tannins and silicates and other astringent tasting compounds. So here we've chosen a mash temperature of 152 degrees. And as you can see here, we've set the mash up in a recirculating manner. Uh, that keeps everything moving along, helps with extract efficiency, and uh, can also help with timing and clarity of your work. During the beginning portion of the mash, we also did take a pH measurement just to be sure we're on the right track. And as you can see, we hit a pH of 5.3, which is perfect for most beer styles. So after the mash was converted, it took a little, little under an hour. We did start to run off into the kettle. And as an aside, I have been asked about this in the past, like why the false bottom in the boil kettle? Well, you will see later that it is awesome at uh, keeping the hops and in this case, coriander out of the fermenter. It's just another little trick that I use to make sure the word is nice and clear going into fermentation. And just like any other recipe, if you are doing this in an all grain manner, just run off into your kettle and sparge as you normally would, generally about an hour. And once you have collected your full boil volume of wort, um, here is where I actually acidified the wort down to a pH of 4.5 before we got any further in the process. One reason to acidify your wort down to 4.5 is to ensure that there is an extra level of protection against any microbial infection. And also it gives the lactobacillus a bit of a head start getting down into the pH range where you're going to notice a nice tartness. To acidify the wort, we use lactic acid and in this 13 gallons roughly of pre-boil wort, it took roughly a little over 20 milliliters to get down to the pH of 4.5. We do recommend using a pH meter if you're gonna try this more of an advanced technique. Uh, otherwise, if you don't, you can use pH paper. Just understand they're not quite as accurate. So don't worry about nailing an exact pH. Just acidify down to your somewhere between four and five. You'll be close enough. 
So now that we've acidified our wort down to 4.5, the next step is to bring it to a boil. We only need to do this for a few minutes because its only intended function is just to make sure the wort is as clean and sanitary as possible. Once you've boiled your wort for a few minutes, go ahead and chill it back down to roughly 80 to 90 degrees. And this is where you add your lactobacillus. Once you've added the lactobacillus, it is best practice to get any oxygen you can out of the headspace in the kettle. An excess of oxygen can lead to things like acetobacter being grown in there, which you're gonna get a vinegar taste. So it is best practice to purge that with CO2 to get rid of any oxygen. As you see here, I simply removed the disconnect off my CO2 cylinder for my kegging setup and blew CO2 under there at roughly 10 PSI for about a minute and closed the lid quickly. And anything you can do to seal the lid against the kettle is gonna keep yet more oxygen out. Uh, this is probably not ideal, but I just wrapped it in saran wrap here and uh, it seemed to do the trick. So now that the lactobacillus has been added, it just becomes a game of time and temperature at that point. Please understand this will take one to three days to properly sour your kettle, so do plan your brew day accordingly. And as you can see here, I have used a heat wrap and a digital fermentation temperature controller to keep the kettle warm and then just let it sit. If you do not have the luxury of having a heat wrap and a digital fermentation controller, you can use a heating pad from the pharmacy. You can use a heated blanket. You could even use a water bath with a sous vide cooker in it and to try to keep that temp warm or any other innovative method you can imagine. Here at Northern Brewer, we have a couple of those people who just can't keep their mitts off of things. So I do recommend a note to let people know you are doing a kettle souring process. And so now it's a waiting game and you got to understand that lacto doesn't really have a very set schedule. So you've got to wait for it to do its thing. And the best way of monitoring how that is going is by taking pH readings. Uh, hopefully every day would be ideal. In this case, it did take us three full days, mostly because my heat rep fell off night number one. But after that was rectified, we let it go. And a total of three days later, we hit a pH of 3.6, which is pretty perfect. Generally when doing kettle sours, you're gonna see people call out a range of about 3.2 to 3.7. And uh, we ended a little bit higher. I would have liked to gotten down to about 3.5 or a little bit, but the tartness is certainly there. So it, it did definitely work. Without a pH meter, all you really have to do is taste the wort. And if it tastes nice and pleasantly tart to you, you're done and you can go ahead and proceed. Oh yeah, there's a little bit of sourness in there. pH of 3.6, that's, that's pretty perfect. Just real nice and clean malt base in the background. You can really taste that wheat. Obviously there's no hops in here yet, but we're gonna bitter this to about 13 IBU or so. Ideally, probably try to hit about 3.4 to 3.5, but the tartness is certainly, it's certainly there, so. And according to BJCP, it's supposed to be a mild tartness, so I think we nailed it. Here's to hoping. And once we do hit our final pH, it is time to proceed with the rest of the batch, just as you normally would. So we did conduct a 60 minute boil here. We added our hops at the very beginning. We are targeting roughly 15 IBUs. And then also towards the end of the boil, we did add coriander. In this case, I used whole coriander, but just to make sure you get the flavor impact you really desire from it, go ahead and put it in a clean coffee grinder or a spice grinder, a mortar or pestle and similar, and crush it up. You don't need to pulverize it into a powder, just break those seeds open so the wort can get in there and get all those nice oils out. So now that the boil is over and the wort is cooled down, now what we have is a soured wort that still needs to be fermented in order to turn it into a beer. For that, we have chosen Omega Yeast Labs, German ale yeast, pretty traditional stuff. Best practice with this ale strain is to keep it a little bit on the cool side. It'll result in a really clean fermentation with just a very small ester profile. This particular batch took about a week to fully ferment out, and then we put it in the fridge to cold crash it for a few days just to allow any residual yeast to settle out, and then it's time to move on to packaging. The packaging step is where we're gonna be adding our salt, a traditional ingredient in a goza. To do this, I took about 150 milliliters worth of water, brought it to a very brief boil in the microwave, stir the salt in to dissolve, and because of the high temperatures, you can be ensured that this is a sanitary environment. And then what you can do is if you're kegging, you can add your salt solution directly to the keg like I've done here, or if you're bottling, add it to your bottling bucket before you go ahead and get the beer into the bottling bucket and then fill your bottles or seal your keg and carbonate. Here we have our finished Goza, and uh, I gotta tell you, it turned out pretty darn good. It's a uh, really nice, soft wheat malt character. 
It's almost slightly bready with a little bit of, a little bit of graham cracker almost. Uh, the coriander really comes through with some nice lemon citrus notes. And you can actually almost smell the tartness of it too. When this beer was still warm, after it had been fermented, before it was cooled down and carbonated, I was a little concerned that the tartness wasn't gonna be there. But now that it is cold with some carbonation, it, it, it gets you right about here. So it is, in my book, the perfect level of tartness. And the salt, while it's there, it is certainly not overpowering. It's almost like sitting next to an ocean enjoying a beer. We certainly had a good time making this video and getting a little bit more in depth on the process of making a kettle sour. And if you enjoyed watching this as much as we enjoyed making the video, go ahead and hit that like button, subscribe if you're not already, and more importantly, let us know down below if there's any other processes, recipes, techniques, or anything else you'd like to see. Once again, cheers.